Hi, welcome to uh, St. Charles Community College Democracy Days. We're talking today about racism, police, and the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, my name is Paul Rosler. Um, I'm the uh, professor of political science. Uh, with, with me are Grace Moser, professor of history, Dana Pruitt, a professor of sociology, and Marvin Tobias, professor of psychology. Um, to let people log in, uh, get logged in and get established, we're gonna show a brief clip first to begin this pres presentation. So hopefully it will work. And when you say the name Jacob Blake, make sure you say father, make sure you say cousin, make sure you say son, make sure you say uncle, but most importantly, make sure you say human. Human life. So many people have reached out to me telling me they're sorry that this happened to my family. Well, don't be sorry, because this has been happening to my family for a long time, longer than I can account for. It happened to Emmett Till. Emmett Till is my family. Toledo, Mike Brown, Sandra. This has been happening to my family. And I've shared tears for every single one of these people that it's happened to. This is nothing new. I'm not sad. I'm not sorry. I'm angry. And I'm tired. I am numb. I have been watching police murder people that look like me for years. I'm not sad. I don't want your pity. I want change. So a uh, very powerful uh, statement from Jacob Blake's sister after he was um, shot in the back seven times. And um, that is a nice intro to a conversation we've had. Um, several of us here at the, at the St. Charles Community College have had really since the Mike Brown shooting six years ago, a little over six years ago. And um, we've had this conversation year in, year out. And uh, we've had several Democracy Days events. We've had it. We had a, we had a discussion in 2014. We had, you know, several years on. We've had discussions, and um, and so this is this this year we're we're going to continue that conversation about this relationship and what's going on with with police and African Americans especially. But it's not just African Americans, but it's it's especially them. And so we're going to start today with uh, Professor Grace Moser, Associate Professor of History, and she is going to talk about some of the history of, of, um, of racism in, in Missouri and, and even more locally as well. Thank you, Paul. Um, I would actually like to start with another video for you guys. Um, it's from 1993. It was a report that was done by CNN um, looking at Belleville, Illinois, which borders East St. Louis, um, and looking at racial disparities in that particular area. But I just want to share this interview with you because even though it was done in 1993, it feels like it was 2020. So I just want to show that with you just a couple minutes and then we'll talk some more. So Nick, would you mind playing that video for me? 60 Minutes Rewind. This is a tale of two cities side by side, one predominantly white and middle class, the other almost exclusively black and poor. It's a tale first told by a small newspaper in the virtually all white community of Belleville, Illinois, about what happened to blacks from neighboring East St. Louis when they came to town. We first heard about it when the small newspaper won several major journalism awards and began losing a lot of subscribers. Belleville, Illinois is a typical Midwestern community filled with civic pride. It has annual parades, good schools, strong stable neighborhoods, and it's one of the last places in America where you can still find the original Golden Arches. In many ways, Belleville is a picture of white middle class contentment. But right over there on the other side of this highway is East St. Louis, Illinois. It is 98% black and almost every one of its 40,000 residents is receiving welfare or some other form of public assistance. It also has the highest per capita murder rate in the country, higher than New York City or Washington, D.C. It's in the top 10 as far as being the uh, most crime-ridden city in the country. It's in the top 10. That's not my fault. I just don't want that filtering over into this city. 
Bob Hurst is Belleville's Even chief of police, and like a lot of people in town, he was born and raised in East St. Louis. So but that was before white flight, be before blacks began moving into East St. Louis during the 60s, and before whites began moving out to Belleville. I don't want Belleville to become another East St. Louis, and neither does the Belleville residents. That fear is so widespread that a few years ago, when a crime wave swept the wealthy Signal Hill area of Belleville, residents got together and spent their own money to build a wrought iron gate right on the edge of the city. This is East St. Louis right over here on the other side of this road. Yes, sir, it is. Yes, sir. If I lived in East St. Louis and I was black, I'd look at this and I'd say, the message is pretty clear. Those people don't want me over here. I would probably feel that way. Does that bother you? No, sir. I didn't put it up. But you approve of it? I, uh, I don't disapprove of it. Blacks in East St. Louis got the message that they aren't welcome in Belleville a long time ago. But Belleville is hard to avoid. Many blacks from East St. Louis work there, and it's the county seat where they have to pay taxes, get marriage licenses, and conduct all manner of public business. And they have long suspected that the all-white Belleville Police Department had an unwritten policy designed to discourage them from coming to town. It's a known fact in East St. Louis, don't ride in Belleville after dark. Why? Because you will be pulled over. And especially if it's the black males that are involved. So, hey guys. <laughs> I feel like I shouldn't say this, but I'm gonna say it. When I watched that, I was like, is, is that Belleville? or St. Charles, because this could be so timely with what is happening today. Um, and if you're not aware, this is the history of our region, not just St. Charles, not just St. Peter's, but St. Louis. Um, so I wanted to share with you a history of systemic racism in St. Louis. And um, I, I got to say, I had fun with this presentation. <laughs> I hope you guys don't mind. It's still here. There is a myth in America that racism was somehow resolved with the civil rights movement and you pass some laws and it just goes away. But that is not the case because of systemic racism. It's not necessarily, which I think since 2016, We've seen the open racism become somehow socially acceptable again. But for a while, it went underground and it was not socially acceptable to be openly racist. Like that police officer, police chief in that Belleville video. Like, I just got the impression from his smug little face that he was a member of the KKK and, and making jokes about it. I mean, I don't know that, but he gave that impression. That open hostility has come out in our area today. I apologize, my daughter is coming in and out in the background, just ignore her. <laughs> but that open hostility has, has come out again since 2016. We, see, we hear people suddenly feel comfortable being physically racist and, and saying those things where before it was secret, se secretly whispered behind closed doors. Um, in previous uh, presentations, I've talked about this phenomenon that's happened post-Ferguson, where I'll be talking to white people and they'll like kind of say something coded, where it's kind of like, are you in the club? Are you in the white people club, the racist white people club? And be really cautious about what they're saying, um, kind of feeling me out. And I, I, that's a really uncomfortable position to be in and I really didn't like it. So I just avoided talking about Ferguson and all of those things. But I want to talk about the quote unquote good people, the good people who aren't racist, who don't understand um, that racism is systemic. And I want to provide a case for that. So that's what I'm going to get into um, here. All right, so um, today we're going to talk about what systemic racism is and what it looks like in St. Louis and in the metropolitan St. Louis area. Um, and then I want to specifically talk about something that was presented in that video, which is boundaries, right? So this was like what really, when, when I was thinking about when um, Paul Rosler effect, or asked me, when Paul asked me to do this thing, I was thinking about how can I talk about racism in another way that I haven't already talked about multiple times in the past six years. Um, and I thought, oh, 
concrete barriers. Like there's these physical representations of racism and segregation and discrimination, systemic racism present in our communities. I wanna talk about that and maybe I can help put all of this into perspective. So that's what I wanted to talk a little bit about um, with you guys today. But first I wanna talk about just really basic, what is systemic racism? Systemic racism is a form of racism that is embedded in our normal practice of a society or an organization. So it can lead to such issues as discrimination in criminal justice, employment, housing, healthcare, political power, and education among other use issues. And yeah, guys, I threw this in here because I did get that information from Wikipedia. It can be pretty useful. You just gotta learn how to use it responsibly, right? But that idea of systemic racism was something that was presented by Kwame Ture, who is formerly Stokely Carmichael and a Charles Hamilton with this book right here, Black Power, The Politics of Liberation. So they point out that racism has been ingrained in our culture. It's ingrained in our housing practices. It's ingrained in our laws. And even though there were laws to address some of those things, it is still prevalent within our society today. Um, and it can be through implicit bias, but it can also be an actual physical barriers that we still have present in our society today. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about the history, particularly in St. Louis. And in preparation for this presentation, I just did a little Google search on St. Louis and it came up with the most popular searches, right? And I want you to look, take a look at these because it shows what I call a troubling pattern. When I Googled St. Louis, the popular questions were, what is the bad side of St. Louis? And it answered, North St. Louis. And right under that is, what are the worst neighborhoods in St. Louis? And it gives the most dangerous neighborhoods in St. Louis. Do you guys know anything that these have in common? Catching anything? <laughs> these are the black neighborhoods. They were created through segregation policies, through white flight. These are a product of systemic racism. Now, just in contrast, what is the richest part of St. Louis? What are the best suburbs? These are all primarily white neighborhoods created through systemic racism, created through policies, through laws in St. Louis. And also they're wealthier, right? So when we talk about systemic racism, we're talking about economic impact and it is generational. And it's not because these people are just better. It's because of racism. We're also talking about educational opportunities. School funding is tied to property value. So if you are restricted and blocked and through actual legal discrimination of redlining and other um, restrictive covenants and segregation, you are blocked for generations into this economic cycle of poverty, racism. So let's talk about a brief history of racism in St. Louis. And um, I actually gave these slides to Michael Kelker and he's gonna make them available to you. It has the source that I used for this. It's a really great article that was written in St. Louis Magazine. Um, that was actually help written. It was uh, one of my former professors from UMSL is actually referenced in this. Um, she's an African-American historian in St. Louis. And she did some pivotal work on um, studying the civil rights um, activity of St. Louisans in the 1960s. But it's a really great story if you wanna hear just sort of like basics on segregation in St. Louis. But it starts back with our very origin when 1820 was the Missouri Compromise. It creates Missouri as a slave state. So I remember I was putting together an African-American history class for the first time. Um, it started this fall and I was sitting there doing the research and I was like, pardon my French, oh shit, 
Missouri is a Southern state. <laughs> I was like, wait a minute. I thought we were the Midwest, but I was like, no, like we had the exact same laws as any Southern state from segregation. Like we are a Southern state. That is our heritage. We might've stayed in the union, but we're a Southern state. We're a slave state. And an example of this is that Missouri um, banned free black Americans from living in the state. And I came across Hiram Revels, who was one of the first senators that was elected, first black senator that was elected in, um, during reconstruction period in Mississippi. Um, but he was originally from Ohio and he actually came to Missouri in the 1840s and worked in an AME church here or a Methodist church here. And he was actually kicked out of the state um, because of this law that prohibited free black people from living in our state. So we are a slave state, that is our heritage. We're not good in the eyes of history, so to speak, if we're gonna be really judgmental and say, hey, which I'm, I'm working from the basic premise that everybody here thinks slavery bad, freedom good, right? So if you will protect slavery, then that's problematic, not so good. You lean more towards this side. Missouri is also the location for a pivotal um, civil rights case, the Dred Scott decision in 1858. Dred Scott was a slave in St. Louis who was taken into free territory um, and he sues for his freedom on the premise that he is entitled to his freedom because he lived in this territory where slavery was abolished. Um, the Supreme Court decides against him and actually says, no, actually black people are no longer citizens. That has its root in St. Louis. The 1863 Emancipation Proclamation happens um, and Missouri actually voluntarily lets go of slavery in 1865 and the 13th Amendment codifies this freedom into constitutional law. Now that is interesting that Missouri let go of slavery voluntarily, but that's in part due to the action of um, St. Louis activists and abolitionists. Um, and also the fact that Missouri, even though it had slavery, it was not as essential to the economy as it was in Mississippi or Alabama. But then reconstruction ends due to white supremacy and people re actively resisting all of that. And the 14th and 15th amendments, the 13th amendment, those are all pretty much undermined by the Supreme Court um, so that they're not actually in place anymore. Um, that's something that I just talked about last week with some of my students in my African-American history class. But the Supreme Court basically gutted um, the 14th and 15th amendments in its application towards protecting African-Americans specifically. And as a result of that, we see the onset of Jim Crow segregation. Um, and segregation can be de facto or de jure, um, depending on which region of the country it's in. Um, most of the Midwest is involved in segregation and the North is involved in segregation that applies to um, schools and neighborhoods. In the South, you don't see as much segregation um, applied to uh, neighborhoods because it was convenient to have your domestic workers be close by in order to have them come to your houses and work. But segregation is everywhere. And in St. Louis, we see a segregation bill get introduced in 1913 and become codified in 1916. And one of the things that happens in St. Louis that is so interesting is that the film A Birth of a Nation is shown in 1915. And when people come out, which those of you who don't know The Birth of a Nation that was made in 1915, it's the story where the KKK are the heroes. <laughs> so it's not, <laughs> it's, it's really racist. And there's a bunch of people in blackface. So bad movie, but it's shown in um, theaters in St. Louis. And there's in one particular scene, there is a white woman who jumps to her death rather than marry a black man. Um, and the implication was that it was rape, right? And this becomes a major justification for segregation bills. And when St. Louis residents walked out of the theater, they were given pamphlets telling them to vote for the segregation bill, to support the segregation bill. So it passes. But in 1917, the Supreme Court decision in Buchanan versus Worley abolishes, says it's unconstitutional. But segregation does not disappear. 
it's replaced with something that are called restrictive covenants. Now, restrictive covenants are an agreement that you would sign when you bought your house where you promise not to sell it to a Black family afterwards. And restrictive covenants are in place, guys, up until the present. There are still, sorry, Athos, my dog. There are still restrictive covenants, not active, but still in the paperwork. Um, in 2008, Athos. In 2008, um, my uh, uncle bought a house in Glendale, which is one of those neighborhoods that's considered one of the best neighborhoods in St. Louis. And within the paperwork for his house was a restrictive covenant. And when he asked the realtor about it, they said, oh, that's not really in place anymore, right? Because it's illegal. It's illegal, according to the uh, 1968 Fair Housing Act. But it was still there in the paperwork. So if it was illegal, why is it still there in the documentation that you're given when you're buying a house? Why is it still in the documentation? All right, And that's because it's still here. It's still present. Um, also in 1917, uh, there's the East St. Louis race massacre. So African-Americans are becoming the victims to this white supremacy mentality. That's also our heritage. And notice that I didn't say the East St. Louis race riot, because I don't believe you should call it a riot, because it wasn't Black people and white people fighting in the streets. It's white people systematically targeting and killing African-Americans. So it was a massacre. In 1934, the FHA is created, the Federal Housing Administration. And in this law, um, they created Black neighborhoods and gave them a DU rating. And where this is problematic is that banks use the rating given by the Federal Housing Administration to determine whether or not people could be given home loans, right? A D rating would mean that that was a bad investment and that you shouldn't invest money in this and you shouldn't give loans. And so this is the onset of redlining, drawing these lines around black neighborhoods and restricting banks from um, giving any types of loans to improvement and leading to the decline of those individual cities. It also blocks people from being able to move past those boundaries and move into white neighborhoods. When we do have examples of black families getting money and attempting to move into um, white neighborhoods, there are stories of riots and people and white people with guns showing up outside their houses. There's a really famous case of this in Chicago um, and that happens in the 1930s. And there's just, just total terrorization and intimidation of the black family who tries to move in. Um, off subject a little bit, but if you guys are watching the HBO TV series, Lovecraft Country, they actually show this in one of the episodes. And I think one of the funniest things or one of the, the things about that show that concerns me the most is that people will watch that and think that it is fictional because it's a monster TV show. But that is the reality. Jim Crow segregation is a horror movie. It is really like that. And I don't think enough of us realize that. Um, in 1948, Shelley versus Kramer um, establishes, which is the St. Louis case, establishes that restrictive covenants are illegal but they are still in force just under the books, under, under the counter, right? It's hidden. In 1940, there's a riot at Fairgrounds Park, um, which white residents rioting when black children attempt to swim. So if segregation is challenged, um, black Americans were not allowed to swim in segregated swimming pools, then white people resist with riots. Hey, mom. 1954 is Brown versus the Board of Education um, that says that school segregation is legal. In St. Louis, Frankie Freeman, um, an attorney, challenges the housing authority um, and wins uh, for discrimination against Black Americans. Um, in the 1950s, Black neighborhoods are raised for the um, uh, for the construction of I-55. And many of those 
families that were in successful Black communities are sent to live in the projects at Pruitt Igo the same year that it's completed. So even when Black communities were established that were successful and were good, those have been destroyed in St. Louis history. There's case after case of these Black middle-class neighborhoods that have been due to eminent domain um, removed and made way for um, development in um, houses and everything. There was actually a Black uh, neighborhood that was in present day Brentwood, um, where the Target is and all those places down there that was just totally raised and houses and Target and Trader Joe's and these white places were built on top and the Black community was erased. In the 1960s, Black St. Louisans are involved in civil rights protests. And we see the Jefferson Bank protests, which were successful when the bank was practicing discrimination policies against Black um, investors, then um, they were protested and these became national attention. In the next year, Percy Green and Richard Daly actually protested the construction of the arch because they were refusing to work with Black construction workers and companies and won. 1968, Jones versus Alfred H. Mayer made racial discrimination in housing illegal. Still exists. In 1978, 10 years after civil rights, um, Blackjack, the city of Blackjack, which is actually really close to me in North County, was taken to court over um, refusing a multiracial apartment complex to be built. Full disclosure, in the early 2000s, when I was looking for an apartment to move into, I was told, don't go to Blackjack, they allow Section 5 housing. That was in the 2000s. Don't buy any, or don't go to any apartment where there are people who get financial assistance from the government. Because the idea is that those people are dangerous. Getting into that same concept that was in place with um, the dangerous neighborhoods. When Ferguson happened in 2014, I went to a company or a I Heart Ferguson organization like meeting for the first time. And the former mayor of Ferguson got up and said, we didn't ask for section five people to um, come here. They were forced on us as if that was the reason why Ferguson had experienced a decline. Not because white people got scared and left as it, that's the reason why Ferguson experienced a decline. In 1983, the year that I was born, St. Louis City Schools um, were bused into St. Louis County Schools. Because of white flight, the city had become segregated again. And so the solution became busing. In um, 2012, possibly, was that when Normandy was bused into Francis Howell? 2015, relatively recently, it was just a few years ago, mass protest broke out in, among parents at a community meeting. They began screaming and yelling about um, Normandy thugs being brought into the school district, bust into their school district. And did they need to install, um, what are those, uh, metal detectors? to make sure that those students were not bringing guns. Talking about children, right? Busing has been resisted by white families and we see further movement just to get away from black families. It's not until 1993 and 1997 that St. Louis gets its first black mayors and every mayor since then has been white. 2014, Mike Brown is killed in a St. Louis suburb. And it happens in the context of a divided city. We have been divided. We have systemic racism. We have the most obvious proof of systemic racism in the form of segregation. St. Louis, I think in 2014 was determined to be the third most segregated city in the country. And here is the result. We see this movement develop about the inequality that's still been in place that affects the economic 
and financial situation of so many Black families. And at the same time, they are blamed for their own poverty. And that is not right. That is the history of St. Louis. So are any of us really surprised that we see this movement start in St. Louis? And we can see it in the symbols of segregation. So we saw the gate that was built um, in Belleville in 1993. In 2018 in Ferguson, a concrete barrier was finally removed out of a street that connected Ferguson to Kinloch, which was a black city. We've seen countless other physical barriers. Like if you drive up Del Mar today, you can see the Del Mar divide, which one side of Del Mar is all white settlement and across the street is, um, are houses that are windows broken out. There's no, development there. And it's not because Black people have not tried. There are still Black families who are not given loans from banks when they try to improve those houses, because according to the bank, that's a bad investment. But literally 500 feet away are million dollar mansions. That is a barrier. That is a physical representation of segregation. And can I just say that we have a physical representation of segregation here in our area in St. Peter's and St. Charles, except this time it was convenient because it was natural, it was the Missouri River. How many times have you heard people say across the river as if it's a foreign country, worried about people coming across the river that riffraff, blocking expansion of the bi-state bus system, blocking expansion of the Metrolink, which guys, I just wanna point out that this racism is hurting everyone. It hurts everyone. The idea that St. Charles County does not have public transportation is ludicrous. And it hurts students because people have to take Ubers and taxis to get to school. When I worked at St. Louis Community College, we had a bus stop at the front of the school which just dropped students off and it made things so much easier. We need to really think about this obvious systemic racism in our area and how we can change it. So what can we do? What can we do? Right now, I believe it was uh, Nelson Mandela that said um, something along the lines of everything seems impossible until it's done. Right, so we just got to do it small steps at a time. And I really like this quote by James Lowen who wrote, lies my teacher told me. He says, the antidote to feel good history is not feel bad history, but honest and inclusive history. And the way that I view things is that we need to tell the truth about racism and the history of racism in our community. We need to tell the truth about what is happening in our society. We need to acknowledge that there is a history of segregation in St. Louis and that we in St. Charles and St. Peter's are the product of that history. The problems that we have today are the product of that history. And if we don't know that history, how can we do anything to change it? So I'm sorry if this was, I'm not sorry. This might be intense, but I feel like students really need to understand this. We need to know the real story of our own city, of our own place. So that's just providing some context to what we have been, what we are discussing today. So I will hand it back over to Paul and thanks guys. I think uh, Dana was gonna jump in with some sociological perspective. And I am just one moment while I screen share. And that's not what you're supposed to see. You're supposed to see that. All right. So I am going to talk a little bit more to draw on some of the um, issues that Grace brought up in terms of talking about the history of St. Louis. And in terms of thinking about the history of this geographic area, you know, it also is the case that this there's this very similar history to be found nearly everywhere. 
right, our major metropolitan areas in general, right? The stories of St. Louis are the stories of the Milwaukee's, of the Cleveland's, of the Indianapolis's, right, and what have you. And so in terms of thinking about um, what all of this means, I want to talk a little bit about what this looks like in contemporary context, right? In terms of thinking about these very issues that Grace raises, but thinking about what this means on like a national scale. So when it comes to um, a, uh, a concept of racism, if you will, right, there are different ways that we can define or think about or conceptualize racism. I'm going to take a decidedly sociological perspective in terms of talking about racism because I am, in fact, a sociologist, right? And that's what we do. Um, and, and, and from this perspective, right, racism is multifaceted, it's multidimensional in the sense that, yes, when it comes to views of groups, right, stereotypes, prejudice, the things that we often readily associate with racism, absolutely, right, it's important, and it is a part of our concept of racism, but we also have to take into account institutional, systemic racism as well, as being part of a larger and broader system in which inequalities are perpetuated. It's also extremely important for us to think about the connections that exist between them. Right. And so in terms of thinking about some of the things that Grace raised with regards to how this is like our history, right, it serves a very important point in thinking about how our contexts are shaped. So, for example, right, say you're this guy, you don't exist in a vacuum, you don't exist alone, you exist in a world with other people, other dots. You have connections to those other dots, interactions, influences, right? Ways in which these other people matter in terms of shaping your context and your points of view. But we're not floating in space, we're not in a vacuum, we exist in a society, right? And that society, it's, its structure, its nature, what that society looks like and how it operates is a reflection of its social systems. And if its social systems are a, are, um, if their social systems reflect racial inequality, well, guess what? That's also shaping the conditions of the society that we're making sense of and thinking about the significance of race and making sense of what it means, right? It is also a context in which there are significant differential outcomes in terms of various aspects of quality of life. Right, so this matters not only for those material outcomes and quality of life, this is also the context in which ideas about race and its significance are being shaped. So when we think about patterns like housing segregation, and I appreciate that Grace brought up redlining, right? When we think about redlining, some of these historical maps, this is what they look like, where I where areas were explicitly outlined. Right, in red, and this is um, a um, from an archive hosted by the University of Richmond, um, where they take the maps uh, from for, from redlined areas, right, and show you what they looked like and how these areas were described and defined, right. And so we've gotten a history of a sense of what this looks like in St. Louis, but. This is what that looks like all over the globe. Each and every one of these metropolitan areas and areas that we might not consider to be metropolitan are areas where we have the evidence of redlining, right? Where those maps exist. And this is just of what we know. Imagine what we may not know, things that may have been lost across history. Right, so when we think about the importance of institutional discrimination, it's important to think of our history, it's important to think about just how expansive that history really is and how we can use dynamics here as a way to think about and understand dynamics more broadly. So to sort of put in further context some of the issues that arise out of housing segregation as well as other um, systemic issues, I just want to talk a bit about dynamics and patterns in education, uh, economic inequality, and in health. Because to me as a sociologist, this reflects three main major areas of our lived experience, right? What we know, what we have, and our quality of life. So when it comes to institutional discrimination or institutional racism, that's gonna become a tongue twister for me this time, y'all. Um, when it comes to education, right? We can think about outcomes 
uh, with respect to educational attainment, right? How many years of education are completed, as well as achievement, right? We often hear about the achievement gap, gaps in test scores, how students fare in their educational experiences, right? We can see evidence of inequalities in these kinds of outcomes, but what plays a role? Well, one, housing segregation plays a very important role when it comes to um, school segregation, right? If it follows that uh, schools typically reflect the neighborhoods in which they exist, right? It follows that housing segregation also um, is reflected in segregation of schools. It's also reflected in educational funding, right? And I'll show you a graphic in just a moment um, of what that looks like on sort of a broader national scale, right? But when we consider educational funding and the fact that educational institutions, public ones, are um, very much supported, right, by tax paying entities for schools that do not have as strong of a tax base that has significant impact on the resources and educational experiences of the students within them with regards to the resources that can be provided, as well as the curriculum that can be provided because you need people and materials in order to be able to teach. And this is to say nothing of within school factors, right? Patterns uh, such as tracking where students are routinely sorted into different ability groups, which often reflect uh, racial and ethnic patterns. Black and Latino students are much more likely to be placed in lower tracks, right? That matters for educational outcomes. It also matters for how students make sense of school. And when we think about systemic differences in terms of uh, discipline, right? Who is disciplined and how harshly? Right, all of these things work together in terms of shaping students' outcomes. And these educational outcomes have impacts in the long term. So to speak just a little bit more concretely to um, the, um, the issue of funding uh, and, and student demographics, right? Black and Hispanic students, as well as American Indian and Alaska Native students are much more likely to attend schools that are high poverty or mid to high poverty schools, reflected by the darker green portion of the bar or this sort of lighter grayish green uh, portion of the bar. This means that students are um, in schools that have markedly different resources that are available to them, right? And this is a reflection of a number of factors, but not the least of which are um, housing segregation and differences in educational funding. It also matters for overall resources as well. And again, these are about more nationwide statistics. So taking um, the issues that Grace raises in our history and sort of broadening that scope a bit more. There is a long history um, dating far back before 1989 where this graphic starts in terms of wealth inequality across racial groups. Right, um, sociologists uh, tend to link um, differences in terms of wealth attainment, average wealth attainment, uh, back to slavery, but certainly exacerbated by the New Deal um, and the distribution of benefits following World War II. There is an incredible chasm that exists. Uh, for instance, Black families tend to have one-tenth of the wealth of white families, and this is a very pervasive pattern that has existed across time and is, of course, very sensitive to and reflective of um, economic factors like recessions and the like. Right, but this reflects families' abilities to have resources to serve as safeguards in case of periods of joblessness or illness, which is a very um, significant benefit that wealth provides. Wealth is also something that is generational in nature. So when it comes to housing segregation and who was able to buy homes because of these policies versus those who were not, right, that matters for home ownership. Most people in the U.S hold wealth in their homes. Homes are a very significant portion of the wealth that people in the US do have, right? And so having access to those resources or not having access to those resources as a result of these historic policies and practices have impacts for today as well, right? And that also matters for jobs, right? When we think about income, housing segregation also contributes or is, I should say, interacts with economic changes, right? The economy changes, the nature of jobs change, jobs move, right? And one of the issues that um, 
uh, emerges and was especially um, especially stark in the later 20th century as jobs restructured, particularly manufacturing positions, were that um, routinely groups in urban areas got left behind when it came to job opportunities. Because if the work leaves, you have workers that are trained to do work or qualified to do work that no longer exists in that area. That has broader impact, but is also a reflection of broader social dynamics and matters right when economic changes take place in a society where housing segregation right existing in different geographical spaces is a part of the fabric of society right and this is to say nothing of discrimination and hiring firing and promotions uh, or the educational inequalities that i mentioned that can also um, manifest themselves in terms of economic disparities as well. So when it comes to gaps in wealth and in income, there are some really important systemic factors, right, many of which are reflected in or intersect with housing segregation to really create a context for not only educational differences, but also differences in terms of economic standing. And finally, to sort of round this out with the ways in which this matters for people's quality of life, we can think about health disparities as well. Now, as a sociologist, I don't approach talking about health disparities as someone with a biomedical background will. So I will stick primarily to talking about health disparities uh, with things like asthma or infant mortality that are significantly connected to the areas in which we live, exist, work, play, and just, I mean, essentially just exist, right? And so housing segregation sets the stage for the resources that exist in a neighborhood, whether a neighborhood is walkable, whether people feel safe doing so. Are they located near pollutants or other, um, um, other factors that may be um, harmful, right, for public health? Housing segregation matters in making sense of that. It also matters in access to medical care, right? We can think about issues of affordability, but we can also think about proximity um, to healthcare providers. And when we think about how all of our, you know, our perceptions and things like that may be shaped, right? People's experiences with care also play uh, a significant role in thinking about these health outcomes. Right, so whether we're talking about perceptions that a practitioner may have, um, or if we are talking about access to uh, medical care, right, these things are being shaped by a society in which there are systematic differences. So that being said, as I sort of round this out and hand this off, when we think about systemic inequality, right, we're talking about overlapping systems in terms of their causes and their consequences. And we're talking about issues that shape numerous aspects of our social lives. So when it comes to those outcomes themselves and how it impacts people's quality of life, or if we're even just thinking about how we think about and give significance to race, right, how we make sense of it in our experiences, Right, these factors are playing a role in shaping those perceptions because they are the conditions of the society in which we exist. So if you are curious um, about anything I mentioned, um, I'm happy to send along a Works Cited page for anyone who would like uh, to do so. And if you are interested in other resources, especially those redlining maps I mentioned, they are available at this first link up here. And it's a really, really great resource to really investigate some of these dynamics further. All right, so thank you. And I'll hand it off to Paul. Thanks so much, Dana. Uh, that was great. Both you and Grace did a fantastic job. Um, my conversation, for, for those of us, Marvin, Grace, Michael, uh, who've seen me before, you'll see the first part will be very familiar to what I've, I've done in the past. Um, my, um, my presentations aren't, um, it, it's very similar, some of the same ideas and um, that you've seen. I end a little bit differently than and I have in the past a little bit. I, I, one of my themes is talking about what has happened to attitudes because in many regards, racism, systemic racism is a, is a white problem. Um, I argue that because it's uh, whites fail to see what's actually happening to our fellow citizens 
who are not white. And so, and so kind of a lot of this theme in the beginning, I, I'll try to blow through some of the early stuff because again, it's, I've done this before and it's nothing new. Um, but one of the, the real themes is that, you know, we've known that there's this problem. We've known that um, in six years ago, I gave a presentation we, and, I, and I showed some of the same data. Um, six years ago, we talked about how um, whites and blacks viewed what happened to Michael Brown. Um, whites thought nothing to do with race. Blacks said, yeah, it did. Um, whites thought that the, the killing of Michael Brown was justified and, and African-Americans did not. And so what, you, what you're really seeing um, in the course of the last 10 or 20 years is plenty of data out there to show there's a problem, that, that, that there's, there's, there's a problem. Uh, Missouri has had a fantastic program of keeping track of police stops. And uh, it's been going on for over 20 years now. I think this is 21 years now. They have data of every year of, of police officers, who they pull over. And um, not surprisingly, uh, African-Americans and Hispanics are pulled over far more often. They're searched more often. Um, but interestingly, every year for the past 20, 21 years they've been doing this study, every single year, not surprisingly, whites are much more, are more likely to have drugs or contraband in the car. So even though blacks are searched more often, Hispanics are searched more often, whites are more likely to have contraband. Um, and so what you see is, you know, the, the, an overwhelming number, of, a disproportionate number of blacks and Hispanics being searched based on the data. And this data is not new. It's 2016, same numbers. 2012, 2010, 25, uh, 2002. Again, this disparity was there. So we know this happened. Um, we know this was a problem. We, we have, uh, you know, Blacks have also get singled out when shopping. This is, uh, um, John Crawford was shopping in Walmart. He was playing with a BB gun that's available in the store. He picked one up, talking to his girlfriend on the phone. Someone freaks out. Cops called and they shoot him there in the store. Uh, that is his murder you just watched in the store in Walmart. Uh, again, legal to have a gun. It was a, wall, a gun that Walmart sold. And, and this is happening. So this, this again, nothing, nothing new. Um, New York City, this is not a Southern problem. I, obviously that was Ohio, but this is but Missouri. Um, New York City, if you look at the stop and frisk, uh, the, their policy there. If you look at who was stopped and who was frisked, not surprisingly, it was mostly black, mostly Hispanic people who were stopped. Yet again, overwhelmingly, whites were much more likely to have contraband in New York City. It took 143 stops to find uh, a black person who actually had something illegal on his person. It only took um, a fourth as many, maybe a fifth as many stops. Um, oops, went too far. 27 stops to see that on, uh, for a white person. So again, it isn't a regional thing. It's you know New York, we think of Cosmopolitan, they have the same problem. So this is not a regional thing. This is not a St. Louis thing. This is a, a world, a global problem, well, at least an American problem, but I argue it's a global problem. Um, so what was frustrating to me when I gave this presentation six years ago, very similar presentation, obviously some of the data is newer since then, but it's the same, same data. I don't think, I think the stop and frisk data may have been new and some of the, some of the, the data on, uh, on the police stops were, were newer than six years ago, but it's the same. There's nothing changing there. Um, but in 2014, white Americans especially didn't see a problem. 51% of Americans believe the killing of unarmed black men would not signs of a broader problem. Um, in 2016, just a couple of years after that, still only 43% of Americans supported the Black Lives Matter movement. And again, that's based on the premise that there's a problem. Okay, so you know, a lot of people think this wasn't an issue. Um, when when uh, Colin Kaepernick kneeled during the national anthem, um, most voters, 
thought that was not appropriate. 54% of Americans said it was not appropriate. Peaceful protest. He didn't throw anything. He sat there quietly. He actually, by the, by the way, he kneeled because one of his, his, uh, his fellow players said, hey, sitting on the bench during the national anthem is a sign of disrespect. As a, as a, I think it was a, a, oh shoot, I think it was a Marine. He said, in the Marines, I could be wrong on the force, pardon, pardon me if I got the force wrong. In the Marines, when we wanna show respect but show distress, we kneel. So, at a, at a, at a, at a, so if you kneel, you're not, you would actually show respect to the flag, respect to the country. And so instead of sitting on the bench, he actually started kneeling to show respect. And yet he was fired and driven out of the NFL because of that, he was blackballed and driven out. And again, most Americans thought that was too much, that kneeling peaceful protest was too much. You shouldn't have that, it was distracting. Um, so why didn't whites see this as an issue? Why would whites be so upset with peaceful protests? And, um, and basically my conclusion was that, you know, which is pretty obvious, we don't have a clue. We don't, we, our experiences with cops are very different. And that, you know, we've all had bad, you know, as a white guy, I've had bad experiences with the cops, but overwhelmingly not bad experiences. Certainly not fearful. I'd never been pulled over by a cop and thought, oh my God, I'm going to die today. Okay. So I've never had that bad experience. And so we just don't get it. We simply don't get, didn't get, don't understand what the, what the, what the issue was. And one thing that's changed is, is this perception and, and with this how this perception has changed is because of videos. And we'll talk about this in a little bit, but here's a very short snippet of George Floyd. This 10 minute video posted to Facebook overnight shows Minneapolis police officers holding down a man. One officer uses his knee to pin the man's neck down. I can breathe. Several times during the arrest, the man tells officers that he's struggling to breathe and begs for some relief. So this video was very powerful for a lot of Americans. And while if you notice in this chart, you'll see that Support for Black Lives Matter has, has grown um, since 2016. You see it actually, starting in 2018, you've actually seen a, a majority support for that. It spiked dramatically um, after this video was posted. So, so my argument is that this, the perceptions of whites have changed primarily because we, we're more aware of, actu of, of what this is happening. We're more aware that this is really happening to our our. Our, our, our neighbors, uh, and you know, and, and so we're seeing this. And, and so we've actually seen a real shift in the polling from 2014 to 2020. You've seen a dramatic flip from 43% saying there's a real problem to 69% of Americans saying there is a real problem with police treatment and mistreatment of minorities. Um, and, I, and I'm focusing on, on African-Americans. Obviously, it, it's also Hispanics as well, and, and even women. I know there's, there's misogyny as well, but I think the, 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 the focus of this is primarily African-Americans, but there's other issues, obviously, as well. And even today, which is fairly shocking, um, you see you know, Americans now totally, if, you, if you've watched the NBA lately, if you watch the NFL, you've seen uh, players wearing uh, st uh, stuff on their jerseys. The, you've seen s signs in the end zone promoting uh, 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 you know, this concern about Black Lives Matter. And you even have the president of the United States, Donald Trump himself, uh, Woodward also saying to President Trump this in stuff. June following George Floyd's death and amid nationwide protests against police brutality. The president admitted that systemic racism exists. That's something he has repeatedly denied in public. I don't think there is systematic or institutional racism in this country. Well, I think there is everywhere. I think probably less here than most places or less here than many places. Okay, but is it here? in a way that it has an impact on people's lives. I think it is, and it's unfortunate, but I think it is. So you're really seeing a, a, a change. And again, even the President of the United States has said this is a problem. Uh, you have police officers who are, are saying, um, 
um, and I, I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to show you this clip. This is this police officer. You may have seen this before. This police officer is telling this this white woman, "Don't worry, you can actually take your hands off the steering wheel. Uh, I'm not going to shoot you because you're white." Um, you know, and and she says, "You're white. Don't worry, we only shoot black people." And so the police officer himself acknowledges that there's a perception out there that. This is a real problem. And I think that what's happened is the, the cameras, the body cams, the cell phone footage, you've actually seen real change on this. Um, so the problem solved, right? Everything's good? Uh, no, clearly not. Um, my, my, you know, my contention six years ago was that we, you know, if we had body cameras, we saw more footage, whites would actually be aware of the problem and we'd actually fix it. And yeah, awareness is up. Uh, mold, I mean, mostly uh, in the last few months because of, uh, of, of the George Floyd uh, murder, but, but you're, you know, you're still not there. We're still seeing very, very slow in police accountability. And, you know, and we'll see. Uh, on tomorrow at, at 1130, I hope you turn in to see SEC professor um, Gabe Harper, our colleague, and then Sergeant Heather Taylor of the St. Louis Police Department. They're going to talk about police reforms and possibilities of what, what to do next. Um, you know, to fund, to fund the police, to more independent prosecutors, um, more of a capitalist approach where you actually make cops pay for their own liability insurance. And of course, you know, so cops who have more complaints would actually then have higher premiums. So lots of different ways to talk about how to reform this. Um, but, you know, so I, I'm, I was partly wrong saying cameras would solve everything um, six years ago, that they obviously they don't solve everything. But I, I, I mean, I think they have helped at least move awareness, improve awareness among, um, among whites. And it, you can't solve the problem if whites don't acknowledge it exists. So I think there's some real progress been made in six years, uh, but we ain't there yet. And, and, um, and so I just, but I hope you turn in, tune in tomorrow uh, for uh, another fantastic program. Mike Helker has done a great job. And tomorrow is another, another uh, fantastic program with, with Sergeant Heather Taylor of the St. Louis Police Department talking more about what to do with the next steps. But before we go, we have our fan, my fantastic colleague, Marvin Tobias. I'm going to stop sharing, who will share some of his ideas. Uh, hi. So uh, I'm going to close it out very quickly, um, talking about um, a little bit about racism. My colleagues covered the topics very well. Um, and that's always a good thing. Um, actually, I'm going to do this, and I talk fast. I'm going to try and slow. I'm going to try and slow down. Um, when I thought about talking about this, I thought about a comedian by the name of Michael Che, who a couple years ago on a Netflix special called Netflix is a Joke, one of his comments regarded was regarding Black Lives Matter. And he said that literally America is so divided right now that a statement that should not be controversial is controversial. Literally the statement, Black Lives Matter, literally caused people to go outside and lose their mind a little bit. And he was like, what's controversial about Black Lives Matter? We're not saying any other life is insignificant. It's just like, you know, it kind of matters. And then people became outraged and upset. And then what I realized is that people became raged and upset because in our particular American society, our social order, and this is going in psychology, our social order is created in such a way that white males tend to be classified and categorized as hierarchically the most dominant. And so when you start to say that there's another life that matters, there's an automatic American response that this is actually wrong or incorrect. Stay down into your particular place. And that tends to happen because we tend to associate black with so many negative things that are propagated in our particular society. And so I'm actually going to delve a little bit to when we talk about Black Lives Matter, I'm actually gonna go away from police and actually highlight what the research says about black lives experience. So when someone talks about Black Lives Matter, it's beyond just a police situation. It literally is the everyday existence of literally being black in American society. This is research-based information. Now, my colleague shared that at the birth process, there is gonna be some inequality regarding healthcare outcomes. So literally when a person becomes pregnant and they happen to be black and there's gonna be a birth process, we know statistically there's increased chance of infant mortality and mother mortality. But even before we get to the birth process, the black mother and black father have to say to themselves, what are we actually going to name our child? 
Why? Because, you know, the research indicates that if a person has a name that's categorized as being too Afrocentric or too Black, they're less likely to not only get a job interview, they're less likely to get a call back. So literally, when we talk about Black Lives Matter, we're talking about the actual conception process and what am I going to actually name my particular child? When that child is then born and they enter the preschool process, we know by data that when they're in school, the Black child is actually watched more by the preschool teachers for observation purposes. And literally, they're going to be classified as having um, behavior that's aggressive or assertive more likely than the white child. That's in the preschool process. We know for a fact that when they enter the elementary school process, that not only they're gonna be observed more uh, than, the, than the white student, common behavior that white and black and Hispanic and Asian students all perform, that black students' behavior is gonna be classified as more aggressive. So if they do the same behavior twice, they're more likely to be reprimanded, suspended and expelled for doing the exact same behavior. But when they also then go to high school, they are dealing with the complication, not only ensuring that their name is proper, that they weren't already expelled or suspended in earlier in the educational process. They're now this, 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 this tracking program. And I don't mean the, the, the IQ tracking, which is a whole other topic. I mean the idea that because you're a black male or black female, we're going to give you to a track or a program that, not, that might not be focused on STEM, science, technology, engineering, or mathematics. You might wanna do something more related to something with your hands, something with a trade. That's in the high school process. What we then find after that is that if they decide to start to enroll in college, and I just want to highlight that typically when you talk about graduation rates, what you do actually find is that high school students that are black and white have very comparable graduation rates and very comparable dropout rates. It's a common misperception that blacks aren't trying or don't try and graduate high school. And actually they do in spite of situations and circumstances that are basically hindered because they're not classified as more dominant or even as equal to a white male. Coming back, once they decide to enroll in college, and they decide to contact the professor, what you actually do find is that when they contact the professor, going back to their name, we find that when they contact professors based on their name, white males are more likely to be contacted and, and get a phone call back, followed by white females. So even if I graduate high school and I then contact college professors, the college professors professors are still showing the same issues and complications in returning my call. We go to the job, income inequality. We go get housing. Uh, my colleague Grace already talked about redlining. We already talked about that. So literally, when we talk about Black Lives Mattering, we're not, ta we're not talking about when I just get pulled over. I'm actually talking about when I'm actually in the womb trying to be named. And let's ignore the fact that when you talk about Black Lives Matter and the bias that comes along with actually being Black, that when I contact my doctor, I have to ensure he does not have implicit bias, which suggests he's not going to give me proper advice, not the right bedside manner, not show the proper respect, not that he centers himself in the conversation, or gives me language that's higher anxiety because we know by research that doctors based on race are more likely to tell black, um, black patients um, anxiety producing information. It's not a uh, cancer you can overcome. It's, man, there's gonna be some bad news. You could die from that bad boy. That's what you tend to see. So we're gonna ignore that particular part of the engagement. We're gonna ignore that. Because when we talk about Black Lives Matter, it's more than police. It's literally the entirety of black existence. And why is it very important to talk about this? Because when when people talked about Black Lives Matter when it first happened, because our bias is to associate Black with aggression and violence so much that the immediate response to Black Lives Matter was, um, Black Lives Matter, well. So the response to a person saying Black Lives Matter in response to extrajudicial police killing was to say, well, if only they did this, this goes back to the Constitution for those that are constitutional scholars for me. What people are saying when they talk about Black Lives Matter and the response is, well, if Blacks didn't kill each other then, which is an association of violence in Blacks, they're basically saying that Black lives don't matter and don't deserve due process of the Constitution 
because of urban violence. So you're literally saying that my Black Lives Matter does not fall under the United States Constitution or the Fourth Amendment because of violent activity that everyone in America statistically does participate in at a certain percentage level. So literally the Constitution does not apply to me because I'm doing um, a, a violent activity that you see in the white individuals, Asian individuals, and Hispanic individuals. So the Constitution does not apply to me in any way, shape, or form. The second issue with that, which associates Blacks with, with violence, is this one. Black lives matter? Well, blue lives matter. You equivocated my actual cultural historical legacy with an occupation that a person has for 20 years. I don't have this for 20 years. I have this from conception to my expiration. So in actuality, when you saw my particular black life and the response is a blue life, you're saying that my life can only be codified as an occupation. I'm not even gonna try to connect that to the history of America seeing blacks as slave labor and then connecting my particular life to another occupational activity. That's not necessary. We only tend to see those responses because my particular black life and its beginning and its ending and its biased associations did not actually matter in the first place. People aren't talking today because I want to ensure that I don't get pulled over or I don't get stopped, which would be great. I want to ensure that when people think of my particular black life, they start to challenge these particular bias associations that our particular society creates. That when someone thinks of a neighborhood with more black people in it, they think that it's gonna be a bad neighborhood. Research says that. When someone sees a black male, they obviously identify that black male is gonna be someone who's actually bigger, stronger, more likely to be hostile, and more likely to be a threat. That's actually incorrect information, but that's bias that people carry. That's due to our society and our structure being composed literally of uh, a social dominance orientation, which is uh, white American technically. Um, but I could go on and I do have sources for this. So if anyone wants to email me sources, I have pages of those, uh, but we're gonna supposed to be here for questions or comments. I know I went over because we're supposed to keep it short and I went fast and that's okay. So are there any questions, Michael? Yes, excellent job, people. This was fantastic. You've covered so much of great value. And there's been a number of questions. I think one, I can kind of lump them together. <clears throat> how best to combat racism? Someone framed it as how best to combat racism without being combative. And that's a matter of perception in the eyes of someone who receives a message perhaps, but just some practical ways because it is overwhelming, especially when we look at the superstructure such as we got from Dana Pruitt about the sociological dimensions and not to mention the the uh, uh, surveys that are showing what they show. How best to combat racism? <laughs> I'm, I, uh, I don't have a response. Dana, any idea? You're a sociology person. Can I pick on you? You can. Um, I think one thing that's going to have to change is our social systems, which is which are very slow and resistant to change because social systems are created by people. Right. And so I don't know, it might be the cynical answer, but the sociological one for me is that we have to really start addressing the systems that are in place if we're going to have a hope of, of creating some sustaining change. How we do that is an immense undertaking because we are talking about the society in which we live in, in, the, in the grandest sense of things. I've got another one. What can white people do to be better allies? Uh, I'll take that one. I think you can educate yourself. Don't ask your black friends to teach you. Um, take responsibility and go out and read all of the stuff that is out there. Um, learn how to learn the history, learn the sociology, the psychology, 
all different aspects of it. Educate yourself. Don't expect somebody else to do it. And then if somebody says something, speak up. Be willing to put yourself on the spot for your Black friends. Don't put yourself in, like, I mean, not necessarily in danger, but put yourself in the, in the equation. And don't just leave it to them. Don't leave it to be an intellectual thing. Like, be physically present. And that's kind of what I was trying to, to, to say. I think this, this is a white problem. I think racism is a white problem because we are the dominant, you know, you know, white people are control this country. We, we, we run this country and, and ain't going to get back to Dana's point. It's not going to get fixed um, unless we see it and we acknowledge it and we are aware of the problem and, and we have to fix it. Cause I, I think we can't, we can't say, well, you know, racism is, why am I studying about racism? Cause that's my problem. It's, you know, but it is our problem. It, it, we, we are, we are the, you know, we are the leaders of our, I mean, because of who we are, we're the dominant force in our society. Um, we're seeing some progress made. We have some diversity now, but and, you know, we, we need to make sure that racism, we're aware of it and we, and we try to fix it because it, it's, it's on us to fix it. Um, I, think you're, I think it makes sense to, you know, don't expect your black friends to explain everything. Um, I also, the, the getting knowledge part is really important, really immersing yourself in different um, research, different books, um, trying to challenge yourself uh, with the biases that you may have. Um, I mean, everybody has biases, but our particular society is really, the racial bias is really strong. Um, there are a lot of different books that people are promoting now. Um, you know, you know, so you want to talk about racism and, and you know, these, you know, white fragility, white rage, all these different books, but, um, and those are good reads. Um, I actually would, I actually suggest a book uh, by Dr. Everhart called Biased, um, which actually focuses on un, uh, hidden prejudices that it's a little bit easier to see oneself like, oh gosh, I do believe that I do have that, which can then walk, um, uh, walk you towards, um, uh, recognizing the influences in a lot of different areas in our lives. Um, White Rage by Dr. Anderson is also another good book. Uh, that's a little bit more in your face, <clears throat> but it's always about immersing. <laughs> it's all about immersing um, and listening. Excellent points. Were there any other Final remarks, we've gone a little bit over and I'm looking at the chat and it's uh, a recommendation for a book, No More Social Lynchings. Um, someone else brought up the point that at least shortly after the wake of the murder of, of George Floyd, rural and small town America were turning out for demonstrations, Black Lives Matter. Now I understand from the data that at least according to one major poll, uh, I don't know, support or engagement among white people for Black Lives Matter has, has decreased. And I can't say I'm entirely surprised, but we did see some things that we haven't before with, as I say, small town and, and rural America. So that element gives me some hope. Yeah, and actually someone mentioned, I noticed the, the front uh, the first page of the slide when we introduced the the, the group uh, was a picture of the St. Peter's protest. I know there was one in in, in O'Fallon as well that was well attended and and uh, and just so we've you know so yeah for 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 white St. Charles County that's pretty impressive. So I you know it, there's really some some signs of hope here. Um, before we. I, I just want to make sure I get this in, Michael. I, want, I really want to thank Michael Kelker. He's been doing Democracy Days for 20 years now. And it's been every year, there's fantastic programming and he gets these great programs every year. And, and just you, and I've just, well, he's just put so much effort into it. So I really want to give a shout out to another fantastic year. Don't forget tomorrow, there's still three more spiels tomorrow, but just, uh, just, Thank you so much, Michael, for all you've done for Democracy Days and promoting this fabulous pack, uh, program. It's panels like this that really excite me and give me the drive to keep on doing it. So thank you all. 
Thanks a lot for this opportunity. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Paul. Thanks everybody for coming. <laughs>